Joshua, last night on David, the great warrior, his position in Christ and what he did about it. And tonight, Joshua. And tomorrow night, the Lord willing, we'll get another great hero or someone to speak on their life. And now, being at a, there's not too many here, and most of them has accepted their healing and so forth, I give a lot of the time to bringing forth the word to encourage and to positionally place the people. I feel led of the Holy Spirit to do that, see? To let the people, these who are here, I'd say like this, how many Christians are here tonight? Raise up your hands. Let, Christians, no matter what church you belong to, about 99%, maybe 99 and 9 tenths percent, see, is Christians. Maybe there'd be eight or ten people in here, maybe tonight, that's not Christians. See? Well now, and that, what must you do to that people? Or you must positionally let them know what they are, see, who they are, and how to handle the evil one. Then there's thousands in Chicago tonight who's not Christians. So you are the, going to be the warriors. You're the preacher. Someone, as I was telling you, I never finished it about the little word that someone wrote me a criticism, not in this meeting now, in another meeting. said, Reverend Branham, I had lots of confidence in you as a man of God until I heard you say under your inspiration that you was a prophet. <laughs> well, said, you don't say it, but or just at that time. Well, that wasn't me saying it then. It was him. So... <laughs> argue with him about it. He's the one. And after all, my dear friend, you know what a prophet is, a New Testament prophet? is a preacher. It's exactly. A prophet is a preacher. The word prophet means to foretell or tell forth. Either preach or foretell. And now, if you can't believe the, bi the um, dictionary for it, here's what the Bible says about it. The Bible said... The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Is that right? So every one of your prophets to testify of Jesus Christ. See, it's the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So now, may the Lord bless us as we read his word. I suppose you've turned to it at this time. Joshua 3, a great warrior that I always admired here in the scriptures. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. And now over in the the sixth chapter or the fifth chapter of Joshua, and the twelfth verse, we read this. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Cana that year. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but the captain of the host of the Lord am I come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now just another word of prayer. Father, these are thy words. And we pray that you will take these words now and magnify them. Put the uh, before each one of us, that we can see the real meaning of these words and of thy great servant Joshua. And we pray that you will plant the seed in every heart. May the Holy Spirit take this word of God and place it in every heart. And in returns, may it bring forth a hundredfold in fruits. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, for we speaking of this great warrior, Joshua, tonight. He was uh, just the children of Israel 
had just come up out of Egypt. And they was in their last stage of the journey. There's three stages of the journey. As they come first, positionally in Egypt. Second, in the wilderness. Third, in Palestine, the promised land. Now, many people have uh, regarded that typologist as myself, has said that was represented after the wilderness journey, then going into glory. Now, there may be someone here that teaches it that way tonight. That wouldn't make any difference, my brother or sister. Whatever it is, I may be wrong in my theories of it, but I never could liken the promised land to be in heaven because they had wars in the promised land. I'm a millennialist. I believe that there will be a millennium, a thousand years on the earth, that mankind will go right back to God just as he come out from God. And I believe that the promised land represented the millennium, the thousand years in the millennium. If you notice, as soon as they crossed Jordan, which means separation from this earthly journey into the other land, they, the manna, which is a spiritual thing, ceased. And they eat of the old corn. They eat of the fruit of the land again. And in the millennium, see, we are eating spiritual manna now, but we'll be back, won't need spiritual manna in that time. We will eat the fruit of the vine again and of the field, the corn. And the Bible said we would build houses and inhabit them, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. When we come into the millennium, that thousand years of rest, when there will be wars and troubles and sickness and death will flee from the world, we will return here on this earth and be with Christ a thousand years right here before we go into glory. That's the teaching of the Scripture. Now, see how beautiful it's typed out? It was a type of Egypt being settled in Egypt. Many people was left in Egypt. Now, as far as we know, Joseph was brought out, his body. But in Egypt, there was to be a resurrection in Egypt because the patriarchs, as far as we know, are buried in Egypt. Many believers were buried in Egypt. And in the second phase of the journey in the wilderness, many died and many righteous men, Miriam, Aaron, and many of them died here in between in the journey and the uh, resurrection there. And then also over into the promised land, there will be the, the resurrection. But those three things type in Luther, age, justification by faith, Luther bringing out the people from Egypt, the garlic pots, flesh of the world. Secondly, John Wesley through sanctification. And third, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where they are free again. Notice Joshua now being first called, elected of God, when he was in the, the wilderness, when he come out of Egypt with the Israelites. In, they could have journeyed in about five days across that little 40 or 50 mile strip there over into the promised land. And when they came out, God was leading them. And they went along fine until they began to murmur and complaining. God would provide. Then they come up to the judgment seat, Kadesh Barnea, and refused to accept God's program and turned back wandering for 40 years because they did not believe God. They wouldn't accept it. Such a beautiful type of the church today. Uh, how that the same procedure, God just repeating history in another way. How the church was called out now in their journey and could have went on over into the promise but has refused. Now, a beautiful picture is before us. Now is Joshua, the leader, first 
in the wilderness where there was thousands times thousands of noblemen, yet Joshua seemed to realize that he was positionally, he was elected of God. And when he crossed and Moses died, then he was called of God. God called him out and gave him a vision and said, Now, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. And no man shall stand before you all the days of your life. Be not dismayed, neither be discouraged. For the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. And after the vision is over, then Joshua, being the warrior, elected of God, chosen of God. Now, when he meets this king, or this great man standing at the wall near Jericho, he was positionally placed then. He was a warrior. And then he seen what the real visible thing was. Who do you think this man was that was standing over against the wall? Now Joshua, knowing it had visions, how the Lord spoke to him. And he knew that he was God's a servant. And he wasn't afraid. But when he went into the land, they crossed over, the manna ceased, and then the old corn, they began to eat it. And one day while strolling along in the wilderness, coming from, Jer- from Jordan up to Jericho, rocky, hilly, desert, wilderness-like place, walking along there, he seen a man. And a man stood and drew his sword. Just a man, looked like a man. And Joshua, perhaps being a chief warrior, drew his sword too. And walked to meet him. Said, who are you? Are you for us or are you our adversary? And the man I could see lift his sword high and say, no, I'm the captain of the host of the, Lord, of the God of Israel. The captain of the host. Who was this captain of the host? Joshua reached down, unloosed his shoes, fell on his face before him and said, What would the Lord have me do? You see, after he had been his, getting his position in, he was to be the greatest military man that's ever been on the face of the earth. There has never been a general like Joshua. No time, no age, no word has ever been compared with Joshua. The word Joshua comes from the word of Jesus, means Jesus or Savior, Deliverer. And uh, so when he seen this man, what was it? It was the captain, in other words, the leader of the host of Israel. And that leader was none other than Christ himself. And what was he first seen in? A pillar of fire. And now the pillar of fire had become a man. I hope you know what I'm talking about. He had become a man. Joshua alone by himself seen just what it was. That that pillar of fire that had led them as an angel, here he stood and called himself the captain of the host. He was the unseen one. And he's still the captain of the host of the Lord. The unseen one, the invisible one, the omnipotent one. Here tonight, just as real as he was standing there against the walls of Jericho, the same Lord Jesus, the figurative type, of course. He was Melchizedek that met Abraham many, many hundred years before there. Had no father, no mother, no beginning of days or ending of years. Melchizedek. Who was this great king? Had no beginning of days, no ending of years, without descent, without father, without mother. There you are. Here he is. He met Abraham out there under the oak one day. And he had dust all over his clothes and said he was from a strange, a far country and was on his road down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham recognized there was something, went in and got the fatty calf and killed it and brought it out and gave it. Milk from the cow, meat from the calf, whole cakes off the fire. And he drank the milk, eat the flesh, and the whole cakes. 
And when Abraham made a sacrifice, the man vanished before him. Abraham said, I'll talk face to face with God. Melchizedek, the unseen host, just as real here tonight as he was there. He's everywhere. That is, people are gathered together because it is his spiritual body. Christ! Oh, I hope you get it tonight and sit real close. Look, if my spirit was as my shadow is a shadow of the, of the material, say my shadow would be the spirit of the material. And the body, supernaturally now, the body of the Lord Jesus is the shadow, as it was, of the natural physical body of the Lord. And notice, if healings, if power, if visions, if the things that Christ had in him has gone out of his shadow, then Christ is paralyzed. His natural body sets paralyzed. Because that if his physical body moves, his shadow will have to move with it. And if we are in Christ by Holy Ghost baptism, and the way the body of Christ moves, it'll move the same way on earth. For this is a shadow of his body. Amen. Always been in figurative type. And it is tonight the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, taking in out of the things of the world, predestinated by God, called of God, elected by God, chosen of God, saved by God, baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit and made members of this body. Alive, ready, willing, my shadow will move every time anything of my body moves. And the Holy Spirit body of Christ will move just as Christ moved. And if Christ in heaven can ever get his physical body or his uh, spiritual body on earth moving as he wants it to move, watch for things to happen. It's beginning to come to life. They paralyzed it long enough, but the Holy Spirit is bringing life into it. And it's beginning to wake up. And begin to move because it sees its position. Joshua, being the leader with Moses, the first time we hear of him about, he was holding up Moses' hand. Now they journeyed. Beautiful picture coming up out of the chaos of Egypt, out of the garlic pots, out of the world. Crossing the Red Sea, leaving the things behind. Cutting loose ever shoreline as we call it today, coming out to walk in a strange land among strange people serving the Lord. What a type of conversion. Leaving Egypt, sandy, barren lands, to sojourn in a wilderness among strange people. But a promise that God would take you through God's promise tonight, when you come up out of the world, you separate yourself from all your earthly associates, all the old parties you used to go to, the worldly amusements, drinking, smoking, gambling, all those things are separated, and you're walking among a strange people that you haven't known before, that say amen, and spirit-filled, believing in all things, hoping all things. Waiting for the coming of the Lord, yes. professing to be pilgrims and strangers, yes. nothing of this world, don't desire it, falling away from the things of the world. See what I mean? Yes. Egypt, the children of Israel left the boasting physicians of Egypt to be with the great physician. Yes. They left the garlic pots of Egypt to eat angels' food. They left the muddy waters of Egypt to drink from the spiritual rock. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. On the journey, cut loose from Egypt. Let them go. 
And as they came through the water, they were baptized unto Moses and to God. When they crossed over the Red Sea, they had a little spell of rejoicing. Miriam got so excited that she grabbed a tambourine and began to beat it and dance. And the daughters of Israel got excited too, speaking in terms today. And they began to beat the tambourines and dance. What was they dancing about? What was their excitement about? Because they looked and see all the Egyptians that once drove them to things was dead in the Red Sea to bother them no more. I tell you, Miriam, no wonder you have a little funny feeling tonight when them old things that used to drive you out to card parties and the social affairs of this world, when you see they are dead. You don't want them no more. And you pass through the Red Sea. The blood cells spread all over you. Vaccinated you. Amen. Dehydrated you too at the same time. Amen. That's right. Taking all the world out. Sprayed you. DT. DDT I believe they call it. That takes all the bugs out. And when you come through God's DDT, it takes all the world out. Kills all those parasites back behind. That's what's the matter of the church today. They don't want to come through that spray. You want to pull a few things along with you. Cut loose. Let them go. Go through the spray the hard way. Separate yourself. Or smother everything that's around you. Amen. Here they come through the Red Sea. Then when they found out they was really through it, coming through that DDT back there, coming out, we found out the parasite. I hope it burns deep. But the parasite's trying to do so drowned. And these people who are trying to impersonate Christianity, living like the world, running around to every kind of place they ought to be, belong in a church and call themselves Christians. God's praying on His DDT today, separating His people, calling out, filling with the Holy Spirit, segregating them. You know, the world wants separate, the world wants mixers. God said, separate me, Paul and Barnes. God wants separators. Separate yourself from the thing of the world. Then Christ will receive you. Notice, here they come out. And they were on their journey. Moses got the feeling real good. And the Spirit come on him. And he raised up and sang a song in the Spirit. How God had overthrown Pharaoh and his horsemen and his chariots. Then they were ready for the journey. That's the way the church is. When you've once come through the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansed from all unrighteousness, and you're ready for the journey. You're on your road then. Keep traveling. On and on they went. Type of the church. But then, comparing that with the Lutheran age, they come up to a place then. They didn't have the full gospel yet. And they come up to the place of Kadesh Barnea. Now, Kadesh Barnea was a, a, where there's a great spring. And lots of little springs around it. Once the judgment seat of the world. A beautiful type of judgment. Judgment begins at the house of God. Truly. And there they camped. And now, God told Joshua, or told Moses, brother, go out now and look around and get a man out of every tribe and send them over into the promised land just a few days after he left Egypt. Send them over now and spy out the land and then come back and give you the report. And when they went over across the little river, Jordan, went over into the promised land and began to look around to see whether it was lean or whether it was good or whether it was the grapes or whether it was the fruits. When they come back, they climbed up and cut down a bunch of grapes that had taken two men to pack them. What a bunch of grapes. 
I think if a lamb with a curse on it will grow something like that, what will it grow when the curse is off of it? Here they come back. But when they looked over into the land and seen all the Philistines and the Amorites and the Havites and the Persianites and all of those fellows all walled up and setting in their big kingdoms and so forth, they quivered in their boots. They come back and said, oh, when they called a council, brought all the children of Israel out, beautiful type now. And they stood up and said, the land is beautiful. It's wonderful. It would be good if we could have a revival like that. But we just can't do it. <laughs> That's all. Said, oh, we're just pray to them. Said, Ma said, well, they're way bigger. Why, they're the giants and so forth. And they're walled in. And it's impossible for us to take them. Oh, why did you bring us out of our churches, out into this kind of a way? I want you to notice. This come in my mind just then. When Moses sent those ten spies over, it was in harvest of great time. Perfect type of Pentecost. First fruits. Pentecost was the, the end gathering, the first harvest. And when there was a Kadesh Barnea at judgment, then it was be determined on where they could go on over and get the Holy Spirit or not into the land of promise where they promised. You say, is that a promise? Yes. Peter said, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yes. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to them as far off, even Chicago. Yes. As many as the Lord our God shall call. Right. Yeah. We got too many people today saying it's too hard. We can't do it. We can. Yeah. Yeah. Harvest time. That's the reason we got this big bunch of grapes and brought it back for our evidence. I can see Caleb and Joshua with that on their shoulders marching down through there just singing the Jubilee songs. Yeah. Sure. They had the evidence. They could prove it was a good land. They brought it back and gave all children a grape if they wanted one. Off of one cluster. Just look what a bunch of grapes they had. Now, Joshua and Caleb, when they heard all these murmuring, the people said, oh, it can't be done, it can't be done. Caleb ran out of the midst of the people and quieted them and said, yes, it can be. Yes. Joshua stood by and said, certainly it can be. Yes. God's given it to us. Amen. I like that. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. What was it? They were positionally born in Christ. They had a knowledge of the Word, and the Word become manifested. Remember, every one of those Israelites had the Word of God preached to them. But it only taken effect upon Caleb and Joshua to realize what it was all about. They said, oh, we can't do it. And the people begin to weep and begin to complain. Then, oh, why'd you bring us out? We are to die. Now our little ones are going to be killed and so forth. And we'll go over there and the only thing will be butchered up over there with them. That's all it'll be. That's the way they say today. Oh, we can't accept this year full gospel message. We can't accept divine healing. Great big institutions and so forth. Let one of their members believe in divine healing and get healed. They'll turn them out. Don't tell me. I know. I know of an institution not very far from here who was given a widow woman help. She was a missionary to the Jews. And the woman had a daughter. And the daughter was laying in the hospital at the point of death, unconscious, uremic poison, after the birth of her baby. She married a Catholic boy. And the, the boy believed on the Lord. And his baby, one of his first baby, had been healed. And so I was out of town at the time. When I come back in, they asked me if I'd go over and pray for the woman. Well, I went over there. There stood the priest standing there. The, the mother-in-law had got the priest to stand there. And so they were arguing. One of them Protestant, the other Catholic, and fussing with one another. And one of them said, well, the mother had the priest there said, well, it's my grandchild. And I don't want the grandmother to go to hell. 
said, I want the priest to go in and honor for death. Well, about that time, I walked up, and here was a doctor into it. And here I was going into an order for life, him going into an order for death, and the doctor standing there ready to whoop both of us, I guess. What a picture. And I said, now, if he goes into an order for death, what's use for me going into an order for life? Yeah. We're getting all mixed up here. Well, he said, the grandmother, the two grandmothers are fussing it out. And I said, well, you ought to let the father make the decision. And the father said, well, he had been a Catholic boy. He said, look, Reverend Branham prayed for my baby and said, I believe if he goes in and prays for it, I'll say let him go in. So all of them stepped back. The doctor gave me room. The boy went in with me. The woman was unconscious. I knelt down to pray. And while I was standing there praying, just humble as you would pray or anyone else, the boy, someone knocked at the door and he went to the door to step out to talk to him as somebody else had come up. And another doctor, they wanted to hold a, a consultation of something. Now they done give her up to die. So they... Uh, was going to do something, the boy had stepped out. Now I prayed about ten minutes. And I raised up and I said, Lord, don't let a poor little mother die. Well, I got up from the off the floor where I was praying for, and I got up and just kind of wiped my eyes. I had been crying a little. Started turning around and look. And I seen the woman at home looking at her baby going, shh, like that, and she was fixing the things around like that and fixing the dinner on. I looked at her for a little bit. My what a feeling. The vision left. I walked out the door, kind of smiling, my overcoat on my arm. There stood the father and all of them out there, the priest, rather, and the doctor. All of them standing on the outside there. And I walked out. The husband said, Reverend Branham said, have you any news? I said, yes, sir. I have some good news for you. Thus saith the Lord, your wife is going home well. I said, yeah, now she's going to get worse. I said, before the night's over, they're going to put a pull motor on her because she's going to be so low. But I said, after that, she's going to come out of it. And but this time, tomorrow night, your wife will be home. Thus saith the Lord. And the people began, he began to rejoicing. And the priest shook his head, let the doctor, and the doctor looked and shook his head, walked on down like he's gone crazy. So I looked at him till he passed on by. And the father of the boy ran up and said, Look, son. Haven't we got enough of this nonsense? He said, look, Daddy. said, I took my baby over to my first baby, and you know it's the truth, over to Brother Branham. And he prayed for it at least four or five times. I took it over there. And never did it get healed. It had club feet. And said, one day I was over there with someone else, and while I was sitting in the room, Brother Branham told me within 24 hours my baby's feet would be straightened. said, the next morning the wife and I jumped up at the same time and run to the cradle and said both feet were just as normal as they could be. And said, if Brother Branham says, thus saith the Lord, if my wife is going home in 24 hours, goodbye, I'm going home to straighten up the house to get her home. And away he went. Straightened up the house in 24 hours, she was home. Been there ever since. That's been two years ago. And this woman, the grandmother of, what well, was the grandmother of the child, the mother of the girl, when she told that to an institution that was sending her so much money each month to support the Jewish people, when she'd accepted divine healing and saw that, they cut off her support and said, we have, we don't disregard Brother Branham, we have nothing against the man, but we cannot entangle divine healing in our program. Well, then you're out of God's program at that minute. Remember that. I'd rather be a fanatic to the world and be right before God than to anything that I know of. Yes, sir. That's right. When God proves his doings and actions, but vindicates them by signs and wonders, he's always done it. And he will always do it. As long as in the world there will be a supernatural God here to control things. And he'll always have somebody he can put his hands on. That's right. He's got a church tonight made up all around the world. You've got a lot of things about it that's got to be ironed out. I can't iron them out and I couldn't iron them out. I don't know how to iron them out. No other man can, but that's God's business to do that. He'll take care of that. It's not in the hands of man to do it. No matter how many man-made programs we rise up, they'll ever one fall just as sure as we raise them up. Amen. But God himself will set up his program. And his program is Jesus Christ, as far as I know, is to be baptized in Christ and be led by the Holy Spirit, free from condemnation. Joshua, 
After seeing that God could open up the Red Sea, he said, that settles it with me. God opened up the Red Sea. Before they left Egypt, the Lord, in the form of the big pillar of fire that was whirling over the top of Moses and them standing there, he said, I will send my angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you to the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, provoke him not, for my name is in him. Can you see it? Sure, it was Christ. The anointed, my name is in him. Joshua seen him there like a man with his sword drawn. And we see him today as a sin offering for sin. And then resurrected Emmanuel, sitting at the right hand of his majesty on high, making intercessions and bringing to pass anything that we confess that he's done for us. Hallelujah! I know it sounds rough and sounds like fanaticism, but so many people are so afraid of fanaticism, you miss the real thing. Did you always realize that scarecrows were put up around the good apple tree? There ain't a lot of scarecrows. What's the scarecrows for? Just scare you away from the real thing. Move on around them! Wait on back there. There's a real, genuine Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost still believers. Signs and wonders and vindications of the supernatural God. A king in the camp. That's what made the difference between Israel and Moab. That was the difference. That was the difference between Cain and Abel. Cain was a good man. So was Abel. Cain was a man that believed in God. So was Abel. But Abel had spiritual revelation. That note, it was blood, not fruits. That's right. And he offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, which yeah. God received. Look here. Here come Moab down just as fundamental as he could be, brother. He had every fundamental doctrine the Scriptures taught. And he built his seven altars, seven sacrifices, seven bullocks, seven rams, just the same sacrifices being down there in Israel. Seven altars, seven bullocks, seven rams, speaking of this coming of the Lord Jesus. Just as fundamental here as it was down there. Well, if God only expects you to be a fundamentalist, then he could not condemn Moab and accept Israel. It would be unjust. Cain was just as fundamental as Abel was. He was a believer, built a church and worshipped, offered sacrifice, humbled himself before God. If it only takes to be a believer, you say, well, I'm a believer. Well, if God's never given you the Holy Ghost, you're not a believer yet. That's right, for God is under obligation to give you the Holy Spirit. When he said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God's under obligation to do it. Yeah. For us to who? The apostles? No, sir. Peter said, it's for you and your children and them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. No matter how far it is, for every believer... All theologians smear the putty over the top of it. <laughs> that don't make any difference. She's sprouting up everywhere now. Amen. I'm so happy for the Lord Jesus and for His people. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to get you to see what, what where you're at. You can only get your uh, get the eyes open. Just look down at where you're standing. Why sickness and melt away from you like a snowball? On a hot stove in the summertime. Diseases and so forth. Because Christ promised it. It's his promise. Now, look when this angel was whirling above him in a sign of a pillar of fire. That was in the nighttime. In the daytime, it looked like a white cloud circling over him. And when they was uh, under this, he said, now I'm going to send him before you. He said, now I have given you Palestine. All of it's yours. Just go and possess it. That's all you have to do. Well, here they started. God blessing them and giving them great big joys and great big revivals and so forth as they went. And they come right up there. And because they seen it was all possessed all over with great big oppositions, they were scared. God said, how long will I suffer with you? He said, Moses, step out of the way. And I'll slay every one of them. After I perform these... Is that in a picture of the Pentecostal church today? said, as many miracles as I perform before them. 
and showed in the face of the unbeliever that I have called them. And I performed these miracles and yet they won't believe me. What a, what a rebuke to the church. There's many things that I've done. I've healed the sick, the lame, the blind, I've raised the dead, I've performed miracles, I've done everything all across the country and yet they won't believe me. I've given the Holy Spirit, brought him into the covenant. Did he do Israel? Sure, right through the Red Sea, the baptism on. I've given joy and happiness, performed miracles and fed them. Still they disbelieve. And they said there's something just a little bit beyond. Oh, we're satisfied to belong to church. As long as we go to church, it's all right, I suppose. Here comes Joshua way back and Caleb and said, the land is real. Here's the evidence. Praise God. God. Here's the evidence that God's promise is true. We have the evidence here to prove it. They said, well, the other said, you can't do it. You can't do it. You get too much fanaticism mixed into it. We just can't over it. If you do, we're just going to break up all of our congregations. We're going to do this. <laughs> if that ain't the same old wine today. That's right. Oh, it'll never work. I tell you, you can't make it work. No, we can't make it work. But he who said it would work is able to make it work. If he can ever get people enough under his control, get souls submitted to him, that he can do it, I'll say that God will do it. We got the evidence today that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, raised from the dead is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we're headed towards the millennium. Hallelujah. How I praise Him. We're going in one of these days. The captain of the host of the Lord is the coming. The Lord Jesus Christ will take us over. Joshua, the Savior. Moses, a type of the church organization who brought the law and so forth, failed. Why, how did he fail? Glory find himself in the stead of God. Is that right? Yeah. So is the church today trying to see who can build the biggest church. Who can get the best dressed crowd? Who can get the mayor of the city and the, all the celebrity into the church? That's what the program is today. As the Baptist said, a million more in 54. I don't care, a million more what? That's it. A million more joiners? You haven't got nothing yet. I'd rather have one filled with the Holy Ghost and full of God's power than a thousand times thousand church joiners. Lord, I have one alive with God who would believe. Not how many we can get to join the church. It's how many we can get in Christ Jesus. To believe Him, submit themselves. Find their position and stand like the rock of ages. At their post of duty and ready. Oh, I hope God just settles everybody in here tonight. And just lets you know what to do. This great crisis. We're at Kadesh Barnea. That's right. We would have looked. And the reason they refused it, they journeyed 40 years longer in the wilderness. Because they refused it. What's kept all these things? I believe the coming of Christ. It's on my heart. I might as well say it. The coming of Christ is past due. Past due. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? The Bible. As it was the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And the days of Noah, God was long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. God is long-suffering. His coming is past due. We don't went into the millennium 40 years ago if the people would have submitted themselves to God. But instead of that, they pulled back and organized and tightened down even the Pentecostals and all the rest of them. Under the old system, we'll have a church and we'll join the church and we'll see if we can't get more members than them. And one raised up in the bunch and said, you know, I believe that Jesus is not coming on a white horse, he's coming on a white cloud. He goes over here and makes him an organization, gets a few in it. One say, you know, I believe we ought to be baptized like this. And he makes him an organization. Other said, I believe we ought to be baptized forward. He makes him an organization. The same old worldly system. But God in this last days, calling out of chaos, how in the midst of all of it, man can't do it and never will do it. But Christ 
himself shall come and shall call. We'll cross Jordan, man. We'll cross Jordan. Now look at him. There they was, sitting in the wilderness. Here was the evidence that why did he believe they could do it? Why Moses said, I mean, God said to Moses there from the pillar of fire, he said, now look, I give you Palestine. It's yours. I give it to your father, Abraham. And I told him that you all would sojourn down there. And I want you to notice another thing. How many generations it took to bring it up? 50, 40, 50 years is a generation considered in the Bible. 400 years, that would make eight generations. Notice then they, uh, the first thing you know, they, uh, Moses come up and they backslid, went away another 40 years. They come up to Palestine another 40 years. Ten generations, meaning the ten tribes, and the half tribes, of course, to split time to take it over perfectly. How they got all the words inspired, not one word but what's inspired in the Bible from Genesis to Revelations. Then they come to Kadesh, where they could be judged. Now the church come to Kadesh, where they could be judged. Then the church is all set in council here a few years ago. Could we consider this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Could we consider the gifts of the Spirit returning to the church? I'll tell you what it would do. Our documents drawn up like this. We cannot move to it. The Dexans said, we cannot receive it. Others said, we cannot receive it. But there were some people who said, went over into the promised land and come back with the evidence of it. Amen. That healing was right. Amen. That the Holy Ghost is right. Amen. That the powers of God is right. Amen. And the very promised land we're promised is right. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes. Now, when Joshua was over there walking around after he crossed over Jordan, then began to eat some of the old corn, I can imagine Joshua that morning after having this great vision of the Lord saying, I'll be with you just as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. Yeah. Called him out one night and said, Now look, Joshua, give him a vision. said, Now my servant Moses is dead. Rise and go to this Jordan, thou and all the host of Israel. And the Lord thy God will be with thee. No man shall stand before thee all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. Only be good, cur- courageous, and do not be discouraged. Just keep moving on. I'll be with you. Every place you set the sole to your feet is a possession for you. Footprints means possession, brother. What the church needs tonight is some more footprints over here on this land. Don't hang around Jordan too long. Let's get out here and see what we got. All right. Every time that he made a footprint, every time he footprinted on, it was a possession. I can see Joshua, after he had the vision, he said, Now gather all Israel. And stand down by the Jordan, sanctify yourselves, wash your clothes, and come down to the banks in the morning. I'll show you what the glory of God is. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a vision. God told him in his word, the word said, I'll give you the land. It's yours. It's your possession. Now, why, did he, why didn't he go there and clean out all the, all the Philistines and so forth? And I'd say, come on, you've got something to do too. God just don't poke things down your neck. You've got to believe it. You've got to do some fighting. As Peter Cartwright said to the drunkard that day, many of his men, he's told him, he said, what are you going to do here? He's going to hold a meeting. And who told you, said the Lord. He says, you got to whip me first. Said, well, that's my next job, all right. Undone his coat, beat him up, got on top of him, get beat him in the face. Said, I must fight if I should reign, increase my courage, Lord. Beat the guy up. Said, you got enough? Said, yep. Shuck his hand, come on back and got saved. <laughs> That's what we need. You got to do some fighting. Not with your fist, but with the power of God, with your testimony. That's how you overcome. By the blood of the Lamb and your testimony. Tell the devil he's got no strings tied to you. You've put this disease on me, but Jesus Christ delivered me from it. He promised it to me. Now look, he said, I'll send you a sign. There'll be a pillar of fire. I'll lead you all the way. You just follow it. It'll take you. That's right. And they got right up there, and the pillar of fire turned into be a man. He said, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. He said, we come this far, now let's go on. Now there was all that great land before them, all military men, 
And now the captain of the host of the Lord, he was a military man too. Yeah. So he said, now, Joshua, now, don't you fear. I'll be with you. No man can stand before you all the days of your life. Oh, my. Joshua said, now, we're going to see what the land looks like. So he sent out some spies. They went, and the harlot Rahab hid them through the night. Now, I want you to notice another thing. Watch what taking place when they were up there. Harlot Rahab's house. Harlot Rahab, she hid them on this flax on top of the roof. Sent the man out of the gates. and come back and said, look. Said, now watch how God's a moving. To so take this encouragement back to Joshua. He said, All this country faints it because of you. Yeah. Said, We have heard what the Lord has done for you. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that. Yeah. Don't you worry. God's got a good time coming by and by. All the country is afraid of you. When we heard that the Lord dried up the Red Sea. And let you across, drown in Pharaoh's army, give you food by manna out in the wilderness, and put a brass serpent up for an atonement. He done all these things for you. Now, I know what you've done, destroyed the Oregon and the other kings. I've seen what you did, utterly destroyed. And when we heard this and you were headed our way, we just ain't it. There's no more courage left to no one. When he come back and told that to Joshua, I can imagine whirling that sword and say, Glory to God, he's before us! Amen. What made them faint? What made them so fainty? When they were way bigger. Why, they said we looked like grasshoppers up the side of them. How could they faint? They were sitting in behind big walls of big slings and rocks and everything, and spears and everything. Outnumbered them by the thousands times thousands and thousands they outnumbered them. Certainly they could. They were all united together. Why can't we run that bunch, little handful of little bitty old tiny scrubby looking man with old sickle bars and things to fight with? They're not even military men at all. The only thing they are walking around their little old sandals on, not warriors. They're campers and dwellers and fanatics and holy rollers. Well, why can't we stand down on the banks and shout and scream and bring in disgrace? Well, why can't we armor ourselves and go against them? Yeah. But there was nothing in their hearts. Uh, why? God said. I'll send my fear before you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There it is. I'll send my fear before you. For you are my people, my coveted people. I've called you by election. I've chosen you. I've put you into the body. And you're circumcised. Now you're believers. And you go on. I'm with you. Yeah. It's all yours. Mm-hmm. Now let's liken that today. That Palestine belonged to Israel. That was their dwelling place. You see it? That was their dwelling place for Israel to dwell in. This body is yours. God gave it to you. It's your dwelling place. God wanted you to have it. But the devil has moved in. Cancer, tuberculosis, diseases. Say, I'll take him out. I'll do this. I'll do that. But you know what? Something's happened. That pillar of fire has come among us. The captain of the host of the Lord. And every devil has got the people bound tonight is scared to death. Sure they are. They're fainting. Why? They hear. Why did, why did these Philistines and so forth faint? Why did Jericho faint? Because the people that had the promise was on the road to come in. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. The one that's got the promise, the people of coveted people, the promised people that's in Jesus Christ has got a promise even at the last days that God will raise this body up and make it perfect. Yes. And we've got the attributes of it now. So they're scared. Their father, the devil, is defeated at Calvary. And the captain of the host of the Lord has moved in in the form of the Holy Ghost. Faith in the Father, faith in the Son, faith in the Holy Ghost, three in the one. Demons will tremble and sinners awake. Faith in Jehovah will anything shake. Hallelujah. Devils are on the move. For Jesus Christ, the chief captain, said, In my name, they shall cast out devils. They failed to get a 
40 years ago, but we're coming in now, possessing the land. The same pillar of fire, the same chief captain is a leading the host of the Lord. It's your land. God promised to prosper you in hell. He gave you that body. It's yours by possession. The devil is trying to take it over. He hasn't got the authority to do it. He's trembling tonight. Hallelujah. Great whirl of God's power moving in the building. Satan's a trembling. Oh, what if they'd only have faith? His heart's about gone. It's melted in him. Why? Or say, well, the doctor said, uh, yeah, but they realize that the host of the Lord is moving in now. That's right. No matter how high he's walled it, he may have walled it out inside the doctor, but he hasn't walled out inside of God. He might be a great big bluff to the medical science, but he ain't a big bluff to God. Hallelujah! Joshua, the Savior. Joshua means Savior. He's moving in. Don't be troubled. Believe. Here tonight to take over. Amen. How I love that. I believe the pillar of fire is with us tonight. The captain of the host of the Lord is here tonight. The sword is pulled. He may be afraid of that medical sign. He may not be afraid of it, rather, because they've never been able by. They're trying hard, and I hope they get it. Something to cure cancer, something to do these things with. But so far, the devil thinks he's got the bluff on him. But when the sword of Christ comes down, he'll never withstand that. He'll chop every cancer loose. He'll raise up the blind and the afflicted. He's a doing it everywhere. And he shared tonight the great supernatural Lord Jesus Christ, the great I Am, the great Alpha Omega, the beginning and the end. Why? The land belongs to us. All that comes to me, I'll give him everlasting life and will raise him up at the last day. Amen. We got the evidence of it here. People who were laying last week dying were males and so forth that turned away. Could never be well. Didn't know what to do. Tonight are perfectly normal and well. The evidence. The land is ours. Hallelujah. Let's get it. Amen. Let's take over. God promised it to us. Belongs to you. It belongs to me. It's your possession. If you'll pull the sword, this is it. Walk in and tear down the walls. Hallelujah. The fight is all old Christian soldier, face to face in stern array, with armors gleaming, colors streaming, right and wrongs engaged today. The fight is on, but be not weary. Be strong and in his might hold fast. If God be for us, his glory over us, we'll sing the victor song at last. Got to, we're bound for the promised land. Resurrected Lord Jesus is here now. You believe it? Amen. Oh Lord Jesus, Son of God, the great Joshua to the Gentile church to lead us from this chaos of wilderness for poor little wandering pilgrims are traveling around through the wilderness, Lord, up and down and back and forth because of leaders who's robbed them from the children's bread. Oh, Joshua, Joshua, the Lord Jesus, the I Am, move in tonight with the dominating faith. Take possession tonight of every sick person in here. If there be a sinner, take possession of him. Shake him. Let him know that we're here at Jordan. Oh, God, one of these days you'll gather all your children Sanctify them through your blood. You'll bring them out on the side of the bank to view the land over, be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and cross over Jordan. We're waiting for that hour. If 
Father, we pray tonight that you'll send Jesus. And may he come in this audience now and do that which he said he would do. And heal the sick and the afflicted. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Have faith in God. I say to you, my dear brother, my sister, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, never fails. He can't fail. What are we to look to tonight? We got a leader tonight. It's the second Joshua. None other but the Lord Jesus himself, the captain of the host of the Lord. He's with his people. He's sharing power. He's bringing evidence into the church and proving he's the healer. He's proven evidence by the people. He gives them the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He comes down and lets his picture be taken with us. He's doing everything that he can do to show you. Not to join the Methodists, the Baptists, or the Pentecostal, or the Branham Tabernacle, but to join Jesus Christ. Believe in him. Everything, no matter what church you're going to, that doesn't have nothing to do with it. It's your heart with God, what God looks at. That's right. Believe in Him as the supernatural, resurrected Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Is there a sinner here who would stand up and say, All right, now I want to join that rank myself by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand to your feet. If there's a sinner here that would like to join with the Lord Jesus Christ and be a believer, you stand to your feet. You're asked to do it. May the Lord Jesus, there may not be a sinner in the audience for all I know. That I do not know. But Jesus Christ does know. Lady sitting there with that white shawl on, sitting right down here. And God healed you just now of your arthritis. <laughs> Stand up on your feet. It's gone, hasn't it? That's right, wave your hand. That arthritis pains is gone. Is that right? The Lord Jesus Christ has healed you. You're well. That lady sitting right back there, female trouble, looking over that man's shoulder. Sitting right back there, just on the other side of the lady with the red coat on. With a, got female trouble. You, lady, yes, yeah, stand up on your feet. The lady right there, the little brown looking tam on. You've had female trouble, haven't you, lady? You haven't got a prayer card, have you? You haven't got a prayer card? You ha All right, you don't need it. You're going home well. That's right. God bless you. You've been having a drainage from that female trouble. Is that right? It's been it's an abscess, is what it was. Had pains on your side, drainage from it. Isn't that right? Wave your hand if that's right. See? You won't have it no more now. Jesus Christ has healed you. Hallelujah. Oh. <laughs> This lady, I see that angel of God standing over where she's at. It's a big lady. She's got a red light sweater on. She's been suffering from a nervous trouble. She's sitting there asking to be delivered. Isn't that right, lady? If it is, shake your hand. You're delivered now. You can go home. Jesus Christ has made you well. Jesus Christ of yesterday is today. Young man. Sitting out here, put your hand on that boy's shoulder, sitting there next to you. Tell him to go eat his supper. He had stomach trouble. He's been healed now. God bless you, young man. You go home now, and you're going to be well. You love the Lord Jesus, do you? You believe you're healed? You are. Stand up on your feet just a minute. It's a testimony. Now go home. You've been all nervous and shuck up and everything. You're going home to be well. God bless you. A lady said, a fellow right back there has got sinus trouble right back behind you there. You believe the Lord Jesus makes you well? You do, sir? You believe that he makes you well? God bless you. Your face heals you. Put your hand over on the lady next to you there because she's suffering with a rupture. She wants to get healed, too. God bless you, lady. You believe that you're going to get healed, too? God bless you. You may have one. What next to you there has kidney trouble, too. You want to get healed, son? Stand up on your feet and accept the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe that you're healed? You are. God bless you. It's gone from you. The Joshua, the angel of the Lord, the lady 
Israel is the Lord Jesus Christ. He shared His power and resurrection. You don't need a prayer line. What you need is faith. Do you believe it? If you believe it, stand up on your feet right now and accept your healing and go home well. Every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rejoice, give Him praise and glory. Thank Him for healing you. If you believe it, wave your hand. Get up, sir. You can't get any better standing there. Everyone, raise and give God praise. Father, in Jesus Christ's name, heal every sick person. 